we have a great panel and a great discussion. The session is entitled Fast Forward Family. We're going to discuss the session title in a moment. Um, I'm Mina al -Arabi. I'm a young global leader um, and a Yale World Fellow. I'm very pleased to be moderating this session. It is um, on the record and we're looking forward to participation of the audience, so please be prepared with your questions and comments. But first, I have the pleasure of introducing our panel. I'm going to start um, here from my right. We have Minister Shiozaki, who's Minister of Health, Labor, and Welfare in Japan. Um, and then we have Peter Matheson, who is president of the University of Hong Kong, but also the representative for the He for She UN campaign in Asia. Um, we have Neelam Chibber, uh, from India. She is the Managing Director um, of Industry Mother Earth. Um, she's also a Schwab Foundation social entrepreneur. And we have Kate Marie Sikfason, who is the founder and CEO of Babies for Babies. And she's also a global shaper. So thank you for joining us. Um, we, we've entitled the session Fast Forward Family, but really what we want to talk about are all the different dynamics that you've been discussing over the last few days and probably in the last few months that we're seeing from urbanization, to changing workplace practices, to aging societies that mean that caregivers are changing, there are shifts in our societies that are having immediate impacts on our lives, but also are going to impact our futures and the future of our children and the coming generations. So one of the things we have to think about is that by 2040, 55 countries are going to have to deal with aging societies in ways that we've never witnessed before. At the same time, 28% of the people of the Middle East at the moment are between 15 and 29, so they're millennials who are coming into the workforce who not only need jobs, but need better livelihoods. We have China that's just changed its one-child policy. What impact does that have? And while we talk about a fourth industrial revolution and all the technological advances, the US still doesn't have maternity paid, paid maternity leave. And what does that mean? So all of these issues to discuss. I'm going to um, start with you, Minister Shiozaki. There's different statistics. One of them says that 40% of Japan's population will be 65 years of age or older by 2060. So how do you prepare for that? Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, attend this uh, session. And, uh, uh, as you introduced me, uh, I'm Minister of uh, Health, Labor, and Welfare, and which probably has uh, closest link to the uh, topics uh, that you are, we are going to discuss. Um, actually, our Prime Minister Abe uh, announced a so-called new set of three arrows uh, as a top priority agenda in September last year. He used to have, uh, uh, three years ago, uh, three arrows, but first one was uh, dynamic uh, uh, monetary policy, mm -hmm. and second was um, uh, uh, flexible uh, fiscal policy, and third is a growth strategy. But now he has new set of uh, three arrows. The first one is economic revival. So that's the, basically the same notion that uh, he had uh, in the first set of three arrows. But now he has two, set, two arrows. Um, one is how we can take care of uh, uh, young couples raising kids or single mothers or whoever uh, raising kids and how we can support uh, those care. And second one is how we can, or well, symbolically he said, how can we stop people quitting jobs because of elderly care? Mm -hmm. And that really, well the second and third uh, new uh, arrows showed how difficult and serious these problems are now. And of course Probably among among us, uh, uh, maybe India and, uh, and Japan are the most traditional uh, uh, countries with uh, uh, very old culture. 
But things are, even in Japan, changing a lot. For example, take, for example, about the aging, as you pro uh, correctly pointed out, the, the uh, possibility of uh, having a figure like 40% uh, uh, by 2060 over the, the, those over 65. Now we have 26%. 26% of population is over 65. And if you go to countryside, the, the figure might go all the way up to 40 or something like that. So there are many uh, elderly people uh, without uh, youngsters because we have a strange, uh, unique feature of uh, demography within or ge geographic demography in Japan that uh, people are flowing out to Tokyo. They used to flow out to Osaka or other big cities, but now only to Tokyo. Yeah. But anyway, uh, uh, we realize that uh, we have to socialize so-called elderly care uh, in, the in the 1990s. And we decided to introduce the elderly care public insurance scheme which is uh, close to the one they have in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, we introduced in 2000, and now we have about uh, 10 trillion yen uh, size of spending a year, whereas we have 40, four times as many as elderly care uh, uh, for medical care. Uh, but the speed of increase is much faster in the case of elderly care. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Prime Minister symbolically said that we have to stop people quitting because of the elderly care, we socialized, uh, we, we didn't have a, a, a so-called public insurance scheme for elderly care before 2000, but we decided to introduce it because Wives, housewives, used to be, you know, contained in at home and taking care of the husband's parents or something like that, mm -hmm. with the, uh, the with the word <coughs> symbolically phrased, uh, elderly care uh, hell or something, something like that. Well, we don't we don't uh, I, uh, hear that phrase anymore, but still. Uh, first, financially, it's getting bigger and bigger, and that means uh, burden on the people is going to be uh, uh, going up. Mm -hmm. And but at the same time, we have to do something in order not to have the cases like people, uh, you know, quitting because of elderly care. And so we, for what we immediately we, we have to do is increase the housing facilities for or, or facilities to uh, have uh, elderly care that, who need uh, uh, you know, care. Mm -hmm. And also we have, the, the more importantly, I guess, what we must do, I think this is the, the case, is the same for child care too. We have to change the uh, working behavior and also uh, the institutional, institutionalize uh, the system that could allow uh, people to take care of elderly, but at the same time working safely. Mm -hmm. And then that, could, that means um, take uh, official break for elderly care or child care. And, uh, and have the government support that? Or right, are you looking right. to the private sector right. to support that? Uh, but the government's, well, it, it's, a, it's a public policy mm -hmm. uh, uh, that could uh, allow them yeah. to uh, uh, take recess mm -hmm. for taking care of elderly or uh, taking care of kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I think people are more uh, influenced by the way they work at home, and uh, no, at, at the places where you work. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what we are now facing is 
the assignment that we have to uh, change the employment policies and also the, the policies that are needed to allow uh, uh, people to work uh, as safe as possible mm -hmm. with uh, childcare or uh, uh, elderly, care. elderly care. And uh, uh, now we have uh, lots of double income uh, families compared to uh, in old days. That means we have no more needs to have the correct policies to be applied to those who have mm -hmm. elderly care needs or uh, child care. Neelam, I want to bring you in here because it's um, correct, as uh, Mr. Shiozaki said, that there, there are traditional uh, family structures in different parts of the world. And India is one of them. You grew up in a, in a large family and the influence they had on their lives. So how do you balance that between wanting to increase, for example, female participation in the workforce and encouraging them, but at the same time having these... Um, these constraints, either taking care of the elderly or the young people? Is it something that you look to governments to support or the private sector can play a part in? The way it is in India, let's be frank, we have about 70% of our population in rural India, right? And uh, I think the weight for government or private support, because there's a huge amount of labor market in the unorganized sector in rural India. So um, it's critical that women work. That's what we see in, in the work we do. Rural women are very keen to work. They need access to the livelihood because that their incomes give them a much better position at home. Mm -hmm. And there is more and more recognition within their larger families, within their mothers and their mother-in-laws. So let's be frank about it. Child support, elderly care support is coming from the extended family mm -hmm. in rural India and to some extent even in urban India. Yeah? So, um, we have a policy at, uh, with the pr 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 private sector. Mm -hmm. So, we have to give three months of paid leave, maternity leave. Yeah? I think paternity leave has also started. Mm -hmm. I think it's a month and it, they're trying to push it to a couple of months. Uh, but that's in the organized sector. That we have this huge unorganized sector. I think 90% of our workforce is in the un uh, unorganized sector. And there we see that uh, it is the strength of the larger family. So when, uh, as a topic we have today is fast forward family, I would say there are huge strengths in the family structure and uh, moving jobs to rural economies, like in India, move them, move the jobs to rural India, mm -hmm. stem migration, because the minute you have migration, then you break up the extended family. Mm -hmm. And then they are in the cities and then they need all these support structures which are going to take much longer to come in. Yeah. So I think a good solution to this is create jobs in rural India, let the families stay together, and uh, the elders look after the young, which is what has happened traditionally. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to also bring in another topic uh, in here about, uh, I was just seeing the movie, uh, the virtual reality film, Collisions. Yeah. And uh, so hundreds of years, uh, hundreds of generations of knowledge was with the aborigines. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of embedded knowledge that comes through close family structures. Yeah? So in our strive towards modernity, it's like he's saying everybody's moving to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. But I think when you're looking at societies like India, where the, if you move 70% of its population to its cities, you're going to see turbulence and you're going to see a whole lot of impact, even in terms of usage of traditional knowledge, greener economies, recycling, all sorts of knowledge that's passed on. You're going to start losing it. I mean, you're going to have a lot more problems. So, yeah. Well, um, Peter, that's also an issue in China at the moment, and you know, mass migration. We have, you know, I mean, around the world, you have 65 to 70 million people moving to cities annually, and the trend is continuing to increase. So China, of course, there is the issue of migration, but it's also um, an issue for Europe in a different way because you've, uh, you know, with your background in the UK, there's the issue of demographics that we need people to move and we need them to have an input not only in the workforce but also in society and innovation. Sure. So, how do you find the best way to do um, that? So, can I come back to China in a second? I mean, I did yes. the, to to address the topic, I mean, you've, we've got two 
massive topics. One is aging and its consequences, and the other one is family structures, and maybe that can impinge on gender stereotypes and, and roles within the family and whatnot. So um, I was looking for the link between the two, and I think the link between the two, as, as Mr. Shizaki said, is actually probably about caring responsibilities. So there is this expectation that traditionally women care for the young, and maybe increasingly as there are more and more elderly needing care, uh, there, there, would be a, there could be a natural assumption that it will be the women that lead the care of the elderly. And it's interesting that, that what the minister was saying about the expectation being that the wife would look after the husband's parents as well as her own. Um, and those are the kind of stereotypes which need to be changed, I think. And so those are, that, to me, that the link between the two topics of the, of the afternoon is, is maybe about caring responsibilities and how they should be defined and how they should be shared out in a way that's not currently practiced in most societies. I didn't know that the United States doesn't have paid maternity leave, so I've learned something today. Um, the UK has just introduced what they call shared parental leave, so where there's an allocation of leave to a pair of parents who may be the same sex or different sex or, or, or whatever, but there's, a, there's a, an allocation of parental leave which can be split however the couple wishes between the, men, the man and the woman or the, or the two women or whatever it is. Um, and I think that's actually rather imaginative. Um, so I'm not here to speak in favour of the UK policy, but I think that's quite a good idea. Um, in relation to China, I mean, many of the points that Neelam made, I mean, China is urbanising at a, an enormous rate. And so uh, there is a drive for populations to move to cities. And China obviously has huge rural areas. A lot of it is responsible for producing the food that the country needs. And so there needs to be automation of food production Otherwise, there won't be enough food produced to feed all the people in the city. So that's one challenge to China. Um, the, you mentioned the one-child policy. So one of the drivers to relaxing the one-child policy was the recognition that there is an aging population, and these aging people are going to need someone to look after them. And if each couple's only got one person, and that, that one child is away somewhere else in the world making his or her um, uh, way in the world, then who's going to look after the elderly? So that's been one of the drivers to the relaxation of the the one-child policy. Um, if I made a contrast between Hong Kong, where I, where I live and work now, and the UK, where I lived and worked until, uh, until two years ago, um, in the UK, the government has abolished retirement age um, uh, and has lifted the pension age. So the pension age is getting higher. Um, and you could say that represents a very emancipated uh, policy by the UK. In reality, I don't think it does. I think in reality, it's because the government couldn't afford the pension pot. Um, and wanted to encourage people to, to work longer in order to stave off the day when they need to take their pension. Hong Kong, which has the longest life expectancy in the world for men and the second longest for women, or it could be the other way around, I can't remember, it's longest for one and second longest for the other, um, has a mandatory retirement age of 60. Um, and so people in Hong Kong spend a lot of their lives working for their old age and wanting to work beyond 60 because they, there's no state support for elderly care in the way that there is in the UK. So there's some very interesting similarities and some very interesting differences between the UK and Hong Kong. But uh, aging is a, I'm a medic as you know, so aging is regarded as a success for my profession. Um, but actually it creates all sorts of societal problems. And my personal view is that the, the correct managing of aging is actually nothing to do with medicine. It's actually much more about social science. And you're right. I mean, in, in the issue of social science, I'm going to turn to you, um, Kate Marie. On not only are you having to take care of uh, aging populations in, in countries that have had successful health policies and therefore you have people living longer, but you're also still having to deal with the issue of uh, the next generation coming in and how do you balance uh, work and being a mother. And so you said to me, you referred to yourself as a startup mom. So what does that mean? What does that mean at a time when we're expecting more flexible hours and women? increasingly joining the workforce, but of course still having to deal with the gender gap in terms of pay. So while single mothers, for example, take on more work because they're having to financially, they're still being paid less than men. And according to the World Economic Forum, the gender uh, pay gap is not going to close for another 118 years. So this is a long-term policy that we have to talk about. Right, and I, I will say that actually a bigger indicator of inequality than gender in the U.S. is actually motherhood. A woman in the U.S. who's single and childless will earn 96 cents on the dollar a man makes, 
and a mother will earn 76 cents. And we really need to look at these types of figures when we talk about women and work and, and caregiving. And I, I call myself a startup mom. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a mother. Um, and w what that means for me, being a startup mom or a startup dad, is that you're uniquely positioned to reimagine and innovate the workplace because we need a lot of that. Um, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution. I'm seeing a robot downstairs stand on one foot and then jump to the other. Um, we're talking about nanotechnologies and self-driving cars and all this amazing um, progress we're making. And and yet our, our traditional workplace is stuck decades or, or centuries in the past. Um, so what we can do as entrepreneurs, as startup moms and startup dads, um, in being a, one key to achieving gender parity is to reimagine and reinvent the workplace. And I think that the, the corporate world um, has just as uh, equal uh, a hand in doing that. I just am speaking from my own personal advantage. And I think that, um, you know, we're talking so much about caregiving, and, and that is the key, right? Because, um, and, and more so, I think, when we talk about caregiving, um, we should talk about the value that we give caregivers, because caregivers' work is not factored into GDP dollars. And just think if it were. Think of how many dollars that would be. And, and when we, we talk about women in the workplace and when women exit, um, women exit right before they reach senior management positions because it's the age at which they're becoming mothers. And um, I mean, w w this is such a wonderful conversation to have from, from different points of view because the, the real crux of it is that we don't value caregivers, whether they are caregivers for aging populations, for, for children, and why is that? And I think that we really need to dig deep um, from a societal standpoint and consider um, why is a um, professional out earning in the workforce, wherever they are in the world, valued more than somebody who is raising the next generation? And what are we doing here if not for the next generation? And so reimagining the workforce, giving caregivers the value that they deserve, caring for our elderly, caring for our children, these raising the next generations, um, it's, it's a big conversation to have. I, I remain you know, very, very hopeful. And, and to speak um, uh, on beh behalf of American families, um, it, is, um, it is a travesty that we are one of the only countries in the world and the only developed country that does not have any paid parental leave. 25% of women in the US are back at work 10 days after giving birth. 10 days, and most of those women are in positions where they're on their feet. And this is barbaric. This is something that we need to, I mean, we are addressing in the US, but it does go back to caregiving. And, why, and I'd like to talk more about why we place so little value on that, because it is the most important role. Well, we're looking to Japan to be placing higher value on that now, in both cases, for um, uh, children, but also the elderly. So I guess we're looking for you of how you think you can have not only society, but the economy and, and the market forces appreciate that those that need to take time out to care for families and those in society. Um, there, we've, as always, in good conversations at the World Economic Forum, there's so much to talk about and so little time. So I want to be fair and open it up to the audience, and then we can discuss some of these issues. So please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, and we'll get a mic to you if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay, so I've got one person here, and then one gentleman here, and a lady here. So we'll go in that order. Toby Porter from Health Edge International. Um, great to hear aging discussed. I, my experience in the World Economic Forum is that the development uh, community and the humanitarian community spends too little time uh, talking about demographic change and aging. And it's very much portrayed here as a, as a sort of rich world challenge. And actually, uh, some of the fastest aging countries on Earth are, are in emerging countries. And I think um, the development world still very much organizes itself on quite vertically on silos. And the other aspect is how families are linked. So we surveyed families with elderly uh, relatives in countries, in, in developing countries, an enormous proportion of those families suffer catastrophic health expenditure events, often related to uh, strokes, 
heart attacks, etc. And, and billions and billions of dollars invested in development health systems, <coughs> but still countries where so little on basic things like hypertension. Mm -hmm. uh, the Minister of Health from South Africa is here at the meeting again this year. He has currently the highest rates of hypertension in the over 50 segment as it's ever been recorded. And in rural areas, people just don't get their blood pressure checked. There isn't even the most basic management of these things. So so it's all integrated, and we need to be looking at whole life course, whole family mm -hmm. approaches. In, so in so based programs. on what you heard um, our panel speaking, also on, on your wealth of knowledge and what you're referring to here, what would you um, say is the number one factor that you could change in rural areas to help deal with um, aging or in developing countries with aging and managing aging? What can they learn? Well, I, I think like a lot of panelists, I think mm -hmm. uh, care is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, three, three areas, two we already know about. So health, there's a, everybody talks that the changing uh, demographic profile means that we need to get better NCD. Yeah. And it's just, there's a target now in mm -hmm. the Sustainable Development Goals, so it's there. Yeah. It's not happening much. Social protection, pensions, as well as mm -hmm. uh, payments for, for mothers, for children, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think the third area, which is completely new, is care. I think that it's a, it's a, it's a huge challenge all over the world, but in, in, in developing countries, there really, mm -hmm. there aren't, it's not really even on the policy-making table. 60% mm -hmm. of global dementia caseload already is in, uh, in emerging countries. That's the <coughs> huge issue. Mina, can, yes, I, can I just comment on that? Because um, uh, Toby raises an interesting point about healthcare and particularly about hypertension. So I'm a kidney doctor, so hypertension is right up my street. Um, but the, the, um, there's, a, there's an interesting paradox for the medical profession. You know, that every um, heart attack you prevent um, means that that person's going to live longer and have different care needs later on. So it's actually very cost effective to let people die from their first heart attack. Um, <laughs> this uh, is not the NHS approach. But, uh, <laughs> but, but actually that's not what doctors or indeed society want. You know, we want to provide, try and, uh, we'd like to prevent the heart attack in the first place, but we'd also like to manage it when it happens. And hypertension is a very good example. I mean, hypertension in rural Africa, which I know reasonably well, kills people because they have a major stroke and the consequences of the stroke kill them. Now, if you could intervene uh, either to treat their blood pressure earlier, you'd make the stroke less likely. You may not prevent it altogether, but you may make it less severe or make it happen much later in their life. But also there's a huge issue around um, management of stroke. So stroke um, doesn't need to be the end of someone's useful life, but in, in societies without infrastructure, it usually is. And they then become a dependent who needs somebody to care for them. And then that takes a woman out of the workforce usually. Often in Africa, it's usually a daughter rather than a partner. Um, but, but, uh, but it's, but, so there is something very circular about preventive health. So when I say that elderly management of ageing is not about healthcare, I believe that because I think a lot of it's about social care. But, but there are aspects of healthcare that would m alter the impact of ageing and age-related diseases. Most non-communicable diseases have an element of age relation. Cancer, um, a heart disease, stroke, you know, they're all much more common in the elderly. Yes, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, let me just raise one uh, aspect that will even uh, make, uh, you know, elderly care situation worse. That is the increasing numbers of older people who have a, a problem with uh, cognitive ability. Mm. Many of them, you know, uh, will be developing uh, a dementia eventually. Many and of us. Well, uh, yes. It's us. So we're all it's and, uh, true. We all, we all have a stake in it. <laughs> and uh, as you can imagine, it will increase uh, very, uh, uh, you know, the demand for the, the care uh, services. But we already have a shortage of care workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that uh, the overall labor supply will be declining in the future, uh, like country like Japan. So if you cannot uh, have an adequate uh, amount of care services, as Minister Shiozaki said, you have to quit your job to mm -hmm. take care of your parents. And uh, that will even accelerate the, you know, the declining trend of labor supply. In fact, uh, uh, last year, uh, some of uh, our colleagues uh, calculated the, the total social cost of, uh, uh, you know, cost uh, relating to the, you know, the increasing in number of uh, people. 
with cognitive decline is as much as 14 trillion yen a year. Mm -hmm. And a large portion of that uh, uh, social cost uh, is uh, opportunity cost of uh, our workers who have to quit the job. So uh, my point is uh, to promote uh, the uh, care services for uh, older people is uh, urgent, not only for uh, helping uh, these people, but also for economic growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, invest in, you know, it's not yet uh, uh, possible, but invest in uh, prevention of mm -hmm. uh, uh, dementia of, uh, or cognitive decline problem mm -hmm. will uh, produce enormous uh, returns in the, in the economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, you know, uh, people have to uh, recognize mm -hmm. uh, the expenditures on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, elderly care or mm -hmm. expenditures on, uh, on the prevention of uh, uh, dementia will be a big investment. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shizaki, at a time when we see, of course, concerns about uh, the economy and growth and so forth, while there are these demands, so investments, for example, in uh, health, uh, how do you balance it, at, at, especially at the time when there is such economic pressures? As I said, uh, uh, the cost is uh, rapidly growing. And um, I think we didn't really expect that speed to be realized uh, in the case of uh, elderly care. And uh, of course, uh, medical care also uh, uh, faces a increasing cost too, but uh, I think uh, elderly care, care uh, cost is a much fast growing area. And uh, uh, I think in 20, uh, t 2000, as I said, uh, by introducing uh, public insurance scheme, that means the, those care will be calculated in GDP. That means uh, 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 could be a positive uh, factor for economic growth, but uh, that comes with a burden too on the side of the uh, general public. And uh, uh, now we are thinking of uh, decreasing how we can decrease this cost or, or, or stop growing that fast. Um, so preventative measures? First is, of course, preventive measures. And also in the, in the, in the case of cognitive decline or dementia, I think R&D for um, the pharmaceutical uh, um, development must be made to detect as early as possible and also to uh, stop uh, dementia to be uh, get worse. But uh, I think what is needed in the, in the, in the real uh, uh, cases of elderly care, uh, for example, in, in, the, uh, in the facilities uh, for elderly people, uh, I think what is needed is uh, productivity revolution. Mm. We just uh, watched the robot that would be used uh, uh, in, in, in the elderly care too. And now we are encouraging uh, any uh, uh, element that could uh, enhance productivity growth uh, through IT or robotics and uh, uh, all that. And that would uh, <coughs> stop the, uh, uh, the need, demand for uh, elderly care people. But at the same time, more practical uh, way of handling this, we are now trying to uh, invite foreign uh, labor forces as trainee status for elderly care. Because uh, uh, I think in, 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 in Asia, uh, Japan is the fastest uh, um, aging uh, country that have a long experience of uh, uh, taking care of elderly people. And uh, uh, Asian countries would face the same problem in some, some, you know, in some time. And even in China, I guess, uh, 
population itself is going to decline uh, in 20 years. And that means, and, and also in 30, 40 years' time, uh, the percentage of elderly, elderly people in the population that would be uh, in well, or the same as ours. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, uh, immediate response is how to is to how can we increase the people working for elderly care mm -hmm. domestically by uh, uh, paying more, mm -hmm. but it costs and that goes down to the burden of the general public through taxation and also insurance con contribution. So uh, then uh, we are thinking of uh, asking foreign labor forces to be in our market too. And, uh, but at the same time, I think we uh, will, we, we might have to uh, think about uh, how much we will cover in the public insurance scheme. So there was a question here, and there's a lady there, so we'll start here at the front. Thank you. Hello, my name is Aditi, and I'm a global shaper from the Ahmedabad Hub. My question is rooting from the concern of my fellow global shaper, Kate. Um, when we lose so much of women force when they start their families. So my question is, why can't we look at Families are restructuring themselves, even in the developing nations. We are moving from, from a, a, a joint family to nuclear families and becoming more and more lonelier in our homes. So can, why can't we create a space of family inside in the workforce itself? Um, I, my question to you is with the f policymakers and also people who run the startup to restructure. Is, is there a way we can restructure our work work area or work environment where we provide that kind of family space to the women, for example, a care center or, or a place where they can feed their babies, a place where they, their babies can play. And, and could, could it be a, more like a policy where all the startups we started doing, doing in, our con in our companies where, where we see we face it firsthand and also from the government of how can, how can it be more like a policy where, where all the offices should have, like we have pool tables and, and swimming pools and health center in all the offices, but there is absolutely no crash or, or a place for to keep our child in the when we are working in the offices. So that's Thank my question. The question. Nilam, I'll come to well, you. I, I, I'm what sorry. do you do at um, industry? <laughs> no, no, to Earth. answer that, I mean, in uh, Indian manufacturing, it's a must to have a crash. Mm. So that's a global SOP. So, but I don't think it's a must in corporate offices. Yeah, but it's a must in manufacturing. So that is. Uh, it's, it's a no-brainer. It has to be done. Yeah? But uh, coming to the aging population bit, uh, so I have a fellow Shwabi who was telling me yesterday who's got an aging mother. I've got, I have an 84-year-old mother and a 94-year-old mother-in-law who live with me. And uh, she said, why can't we have a crash for these people in office? I mean, <laughs> not crash. I mean, you'd have to have another word for it. But honestly, I really believe, I mean, that <laughs> It's assumed that we are going to look after our young. It's a travesty, I feel, that it's not assumed that we're going to look after our old. I just, because I'm, my son is just married an American. And... Uh, Are you about your future? No, no. <laughs> I am not. My son is married an American. And my daughter-in-law's uh, grandmom came for the wedding. And I could see the sorrow in her eyes. Because our moms are living with us. And she said, she said, I was taken to see a home. She lives alone. But how much longer is she going to live alone? And she's got a loving family. It's, I mean, this is going to be uh, uh, broadcast. So they're all going to be seeing this. But I mean, it's an awesome family. It's a beautiful it's really family. But it's so just cool. not uh, it's assumed. I, and I just feel that we look after our kids. So I think looking after our old is just just the same thing. How can it not be? Um, Kimberly, do you see changes in the in American uh, corporations or startups where we see you're right? You know, we hear about companies that have great places to work in and cafeterias and pool tables. Do you? Do, do so. You see that uh, currently, there is a race at the top to provide parental leave and 
um, accommodations in the workforce, to be inclusive of family, and, and that's, at the that's wonderful. That's at the very top. That's for the very few who are lucky enough to have those jobs, and, and I think it can be a great example, but the reality is um, we do need childcare in the workplace, in the corporate workplace. There is a whole sector of women in the U.S., professional women, who are being forced out of the workforce because they cannot afford, they cannot out-earn the salary of the cost of a caregiver. Or rather, their salary cannot earn the cost of caregiving. We have no universal child care before the age of kindergarten in the U.S. With ages zero to five being the most important years of a human's life for development, we have no mandated care for them. So women, when we, when we talk about, and I've heard a lot of conversations this week at Davos um, about keeping women on a career track, keeping women in that funnel to get in those upward trajectories. Um, and there's all the data that show um, uh, that women are, are opting out right, as I said earlier, right before they're reaching these senior management positions. And that is because disproportionately the burden, um, and it is a beautiful thing, I'm a mother, so by burden I don't mean that it's a, to be pejorative, but the burden of motherhood or because the woman biologically births the child falls disproportionately on the woman and and caregiving often of elderly or children falls disproportionately on the woman. So if we're talking about keeping women in the workplace, we need to be real and we need to talk tangibly about the things across industries, across ranks and in industries, what things we can do to help women who are pregnant, postpartum, nursing, and just new parents in the trenches. And, and let me say, we cannot leave new fathers out of this equation. We need to do tangible things to help them stay in the workforce because right now we're telling women, lean in, lean in, lean in, and we are, but we need something to lean on. And, and so to answer your question, yes, we can reimagine the workplace. We, it's absolutely possible to have you know, on-site childcare, to have mother's rooms, to talk about breastfeeding in the workplace and what that looks like because I cannot tell you how many women in my community, and I represent a large community of working mothers, um, and they're, you know, they're all asking me to ask questions of, of you all on my um, social media channels for what you can do to bring them these things like on-site childcare and, and mother's rooms and paid parental leave and then, and then making a shift from, from a, a societal place both at home and in the workplace where, where we are not only giving fathers paid leave but we're asking them to take it. We are being inclusive of young men in the conversation, and, and I, I could go on, but, but to answer your question, yes, we can redesign the workplace. Peter, isn't that part of what he for she yeah, really stands so for? Th that was what I was, so you mentioned he for she, which is a, um, uh, a UN women initiative to promote gender equity in uh, the world, but, it, but focused on three, sec three, three sets of impact champions, university presidents of which I'm one, um, CEOs of global corporations who met in Davos this week, and then uh, heads of state, um, and so it's a it's it's a it's a, an initiative not without its controversies, and I don't particularly want to get involved in its controversies. But the principle of, of promoting gender equity is something that um, uh, I certainly subscribe to. Um, the the meeting that took place in Davos this week was focused on the corporate sector, and I was really struck by how the issues, the numbers, the initiatives that have been tried and, and in some cases failed and some of the things which have worked are very similar in the corporate sector than they are in the university sector. So um, in uh, summer Davos, in Dalian last year, um, I was on a panel on gender equity and I was the only university representative and I was really struck by the fact that everybody else thought I was going to bring the answers. <laughs> everyone, everyone sort of said, oh yeah, no, we've got problems on gender equity. H who's the guy from the university? Tell us what the answers are. And I said to them, no, look, I've, I'm here to learn not to teach. You know, I mean, I, I actually, I need to learn from you as well because in the university sector, there is not gender equity. I mean, I worked in the UK uh, in a medical school because that's my background, and there is not gender equity in medical schools. There's medical student populations have been female predominant for 25 years in the UK, and yet um, 25 years later, there's still not anything close to female represent equal female representation at senior levels. And so I just do not buy the idea that it's a matter of time and that these women will eventually come through. There is something systematic which stops it. Clearly, caring uh, responsibilities are part of that. It is partly about um, um, maternity leave and um, 
breast, places to breastfeed and places to look after small children. It's also about re-entry into careers and it's about tolerance of, of um, a woman taking longer to achieve the same uh, progression than a man would take if she has other responsibilities. And universities can calibrate for that and actually universities, medical schools in the UK now do that much more effectively than they did for one single reason which is that there's a woman called Dame Sally Davis who is a major controller of research funding in the UK and she just overnight said you're not getting any research funding from my agency unless you have decent equal opportunity policies in your medical school. Um, and so every medical school in England, because it's devolved, uh, so it's England rather than the UK, um, every medical school had to look to its equal opportunities policies and that, that single intervention made a, made a huge difference. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to say about he for she, I came from that session and I was walking through the forum here and I met a friend of mine from the University of Chicago, Ian Solomon, um, so I'm, if Ian's watching, I'm crediting him with this idea, not, <laughs> not claiming it as my own. But I said to him, the thing that was a bit disappointing about this session that I went to was that I didn't hear one really big bang idea about how to really make a difference. So Ian said, I'll give you one. He said, the World Economic Forum should become more family friendly. Mm. We should have creche facilities. We should have um, more opportunities for, for women here. You know, eight, less than 18% of the delegates of the World Economic Forum are female. However, um, for the young global leaders and the 50, global 50. shapers, it's 50 50 because the World Economic Forum controls it more. It's more about the corporate sector who's coming agreed, and, what the, and how so, they choose to so come. I agree, and, it, and that's absolutely right. And I've heard this statistic quoted a lot. And it's not a criticism of the World Economic yeah. Forum, because as you say, the World Economic Forum doesn't, in general, decide who comes. Yeah. Um, the corporates decide who comes. But it is a sign of another sector where mm -hmm. something big could be done to make a really important statement. If you made the World Economic Forum family friendly and child friendly, Maybe that would send a message to some of these corporates that need to. Um, and it's true also speed. for governments. I mean, everybody uh, this week was excited about having uh, the Canadian Prime Minister here, Justin Trudeau, and everyone's hailing the fact that we have gender parity in the Canadian government. But so many people are saying, well, shouldn't this have happened anyway? And it was, you know, his famous quote about it's 2015, last year, of why there was gender parity. So I want to ask you, I mean, you raised the issue about there can be a single policy that would have incredible um, impact, whether it's about the medical schools in England or here in the World Economic Forum, what we can do to actually change. So I want to ask you, you know, there's womenomics came out of Japan and, and uh, what they tried to do there. So I want to ask you about specific policies that you feel make a difference that can push this agenda forward. Well, I think J Japan has been notorious, uh, uh, <laughs> in, uh, you know, uh, uh, regarding the uh, gender uh, equality, I guess. Uh, but uh, our prime minister is very keen on this, and uh, I think uh, female uh, our policy is one of the top priority uh, policies of uh, the present administration. And uh, actually, last year, we passed a bill that would uh, facilitate uh, the female to work uh, more, you know, uh, or freely. Mm -hmm. And um, giving uh, obligation to uh, uh, large companies over uh, employees of uh, over 300 uh, to have numerical targets to uh, 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 regarding uh, female participation in the in the workplace, and uh, also we are now uh, introducing a, uh, a new. Uh, um, uh, policy to uh, encourage uh, companies to have uh, nursing uh, facilities in, in, their, uh, in their offices or uh, plants or whatever. And uh, uh, so th these policies are going to be the uh, positive move to let uh, female participation in the work and also at the same time to work uh, with babies or, or childcare. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we also are uh, 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 trying to uh, let a part-time job female, mm -hmm. mainly female, to have uh, maternity leave. Because it, it's been very limited uh, in the case of part-time uh, uh, workers, female workers, to have uh, maternity leave. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, there, there, there is a rather different uh, uh, type of a policy that we're going to introduce to encourage uh, a female to work and uh, childcare to be uh, handled easily. That is uh, something to do with the uh, old 
traditional culture of uh, living with, in a big families. We are now trying to introduce a taxation prefer tax preferential treatment of living three generations together in one house. Mm -hmm. And so if you, yeah. And for example, my, mm -hmm. I, I am, happen to be my typical case, uh, living with, I, I used to live with my wife's parents. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my, and my, of course, my wife uh, works uh, in a university. And um, so probably my, my, my wife would assert that uh, I took care of all the children's uh, you know, uh, problems. But uh, I think uh, uh, living in, with, with uh, three generations, mm -hmm. that really helped my wife work uh, safer, I guess, uh, with yes. two kids yes. Uh, yes. raising. Yeah, traditionally. So in the it's, it's, go, it's going to be a public policy uh, to uh, uh, encourage uh, three generation living together in one house yeah. or in close by. Yeah, that's a very good one. Okay, so we have three questions and, and little time. So I'm going to take the questions together and then we'll address them. So if we can start with the lady here who's been waiting patiently and then we'll come to questions here. I appreciate that you just brought up part-time work, um, and I think workplace flexibility is a big topic in terms of tangential actions that can happen to make an impact both on child care and on caretaking, as well as a wide other range of social issues. Um, I'd be curious, especially from a federal level, I'm familiar with the United States regulations in this, but from the federal level in other countries, if there's any support for telecommuting and remote work, um, as well as flexible schedules. Okay, thank you. Okay, so telecommuting and flexible schedules, and then. Thank you. Um, Laura Listwood, I'm gonna flip it a little bit around mm -hmm. this issue. Um, if we can stipulate that families, and the creation of families are an avenue to stability in a, in a country, okay, mm -hmm. then I'd like to bring in a rather sort of segment issue, which is the, uh, the uh, unnatural selection of uh, girls and boys. Um, it, well, this is particularly hit hard, obviously, in India and in China, but there's a book called Unnatural Selection, and it actually shows that in a number of countries, we have substantial disproportion of boys being born mm -hmm. instead of girls. Mm -hmm. So you have a large cohorts of young men, right, who will statistically, virtually, have no capacity to enter into a family relationship. We even might see that over 70% of the refugees coming into mm -hmm. Europe are unattached young men. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, how are we going to redefine family or rethink this if you have large cohorts of people who will not have access to family structure? Okay, thank you. Important points raised. Yes, definitely worth um, taking into. We'll take a final question and come back to these issues. Please go ahead. My name is Mandeep Parai, and for the purposes of this conversation, I'm a mumpreneur. Although, when have you ever heard of a dadpreneur? So it's a rather sexist term. Um, my point is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We, there are plenty of countries that are actually doing, doing, looking at childcare in a very progressive manner. For example, Scandinavia, the Scandinavian countries, where they don't look at part-time work because often women lose out when they're doing part-time work. They look at flexi work, both for men and women, and have done this very well for many years. And so my question would be, here we are talking about the Industrial Revolution, where more and more we're concerned about jobs um, and the lack of jobs. So for example, with um, looking at automated cars and how drivers, you know, less truck drivers will be needed. Well, then why don't we think about less time at work for everyone, rather than the few at the top becoming more and more stressed and us having to look at neuroscience and thinking about sleep and how are we gonna fit in sleep as we bec all become more and more competitive at the top whilst losing jobs at the bottom. Why don't we all just think about taking a few more hours off and therefore, w instead of having to make it crash crashes at work, <laughs> as trying to fit in everything, we can actually look after our children and our elderly at home. And all of us look after our children and elderly. Um, there you go, a health and labor policy rolled into one. <laughs> okay, so we've got, we've got some um, interesting uh, questions. So I want to ask who'd like to tackle the flexi work slash um, part-time work and not, and not disadvantaging women by just saying, okay, well, you can go into part-time and then necessarily getting uh, the rights that they deserve. Neela. 
yeah, so on flexi work, all I can say is that uh, uh, yes, in the unorganized sector that we have in India, mm -hmm. in rural India, there is an option that women work part time. Mm -hmm. So uh, they can they can work four hours a day. Yeah, but we've got to stick to global standards so that wage rate yeah. should be fit for those four hours. And it's a it's a great option. It's a fantastic option, and we explore it all the time. And uh, I think it's great. I think it should just. I mean, it's a it's it's a no brainer. I mean, yeah. But Kate Marie, is there is there that possibility when you're in a startup and you're you're trying to cram in as many hours as you can to get something off the ground to to make that happen? I mean. Well, speaking as a startup mom, and like I said, I do call fathers who are entrepreneurs startup dads. So, you're a startup mom, and if you know a male father entrepreneur who's a startup dad, it's it's equal. Um, what we are, like I said, uniquely positioned to to reimagine the workplace. And so, while my life is not glamorous or easy, I equally value my family and my work, and I I just make that look like it works like it works for me on a daily basis and that's constantly evolving um, so I think that like flex work is a little bit different for entrepreneurs because you you don't stop working I'm on all the time but um, I do it in a way that works for me and that is what a startup mom or a startup dad is I I will I really like the comment about um, essentially working smarter and not necessarily just putting in the face time I think that's something that we can really hope to do in this fourth industrial revolution is work work smarter and really value our, our home life more. And I think that the, the sharing economy provides a lot of opportunity for that. It will remain to be seen whether whether that works out for better or worse. But for example, I know, um, I don't have the statistic on it, but um, a, a vast number of mothers are becoming Uber drivers because it allows them to set their own schedule and work and then be with the family and then work again and be with the family again. So I think really my point is is that um, we can reimagine work and we can we can don't need to go into an office from from nine to five and just put in those hours sitting at a desk. We can start stop start stop start stop in order to give equal value to in our work and our personal lives. And I think speaking from a millennial point of view, our generation really values this. Whether we're parents or not, whether we're caregivers or not, we really, and men and women across the board, value this idea of, of, of not just working to live, um, but, but really doing both in a way that, that means something to us. So I have great hope for the future. Well, with hope for the future, there is also the issue about redefining families and a really a, a valid and important point that raised that probably requires a session on its own about how we see the impact of um, unnatural selection um, and increasing young men rising up um, in, uh, in different ways in life, but not having the family support that they would necessarily need. How do you tackle um, that? I mean, that's a huge topic, and it's a huge topic in China, as the questioner um, raised. Um, just think, if, if I could just go back to workforces, I mean, for me, there's, all, there's, there's a couple of issues about workforces. One is hiring into the workforce in the first place, and the second one is retention in the workforce. And there's no, in general, there's much less of a problem with hiring of women into the, into the it's workforce. Keeping it's keeping them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but even in hiring, so in the university world, one of the other university partners in uh, the He For She initiative is Nagoya University in, mm -hmm. in Japan. And, and I was talking to my counterpart in Nagoya. And um, in Hong Kong, I'm, I'm impatient to make change quickly, but it's illegal for me to hire somebody preferentially on the basis of gender. So I can't go and try and fill a post with a woman um, in order to make the gender balance better because that's illegal under equal opportunities <coughs> law. In Nagoya University, they've got in, in engineering, which is a, a subject where women are traditionally even more underrepresented than they are in most other disciplines, um, the, it's legal in Japan to have women-only faculty positions. And Nagoya University is hiring some women in uh, engineering um, because it's designated as a, as a priority area uh, with a great underrepresentation of one group. And, um, and so that kind of legislation, I think, is very helpful. Um, and Japan is doing that. Hong Kong is not. Um, on uh, unnatural selection, well, I mean, I think the, the, um, the idea that some people won't ever have access to a family structure is one of the great sadnesses of the modern world, I think. You know, the, the, um, and the disruption of the family structure with urbanization or with um, uh, everybody being so obsessed with working so many hours. And, and, and I'm no one to preach on this subject. Um, the, the, I think that's one of the great sadnesses. And I think if the world can work to preserve family structures, 
whether it's by looking at the workplace or by looking at flexi working or by looking at equal opportunities policies in more general, then I think the world would be a better place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that is um, a, a major challenge. Um, my last word would just be about, so it comes back to a little bit about respect for caregiving roles. Um, my worry about um, the corporate world's approach to flexible working or to all these other policies is that somehow it's a bit apologetic. It's sort of um, trying to make life a bit easier for women because we think that's a good thing to do. It's not about getting the best out of the human race and making sure that we have access to 100% of the human race, not just 50% of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a date, it's, it's got to be respectable for men <coughs> to take time off to look after children. It's got to be respectable for men to have flexible working, not only for women. Otherwise, it just won't, it'll make the situation worse, potentially, not better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have um, we are out of time, but I'm going to ask your permission to extend just for five minutes because we actually have Anne Marie Slaughter here, and we wanted to um, ask her her take on it because, of course, she wrote um, that all uh, important article on having it all or not, and this really we don't want to expand the conversation even further, but it is about that about how we make the choices that we do, how companies and governments make choices, but we as individuals. So I just wanted to take a word from you, and then we'll wrap up the session. Oh well, thank you. Um, so I, I'm actually just going to uh, emphasize what we heard here just at the end because uh, you know I spent three years <coughs> after that article rethinking uh, what really needs to happen and concluded that the two single most important things we can do to get to real equality between men and women uh, are to value care and to value care for everyone, to value care as the work of investing in the next generation, which is, from a policy point of view, the single most important thing any nation can do. We're here you know, at Davos talking about global competitiveness. Well, those first five years of life, you are not just teaching a child something, you are shaping that child's brain and determining what it will learn for the rest of its life. There's no greater way of combating inequality. There's no greater way of making a nation competitive, secure, et cetera. So care, from that point of view, is absolutely essential. And of course, at the other end of life, it is the moral obligation to those who cared for us. Uh, so valuing care, and then second, valuing care as men do it as well as women. There is no way to change women's roles without changing men's roles equally. And there is no way, as exactly as you said, they're startup moms and startup dads. <coughs> they're working fathers as well as working mothers. As long as this is a women's issue, it will never be resolved. It has to be a human issue. We have to recognize all human beings are likely to be caregivers at some point in their lives, whether that's children or parents or friends or community members. It's not about being married or, or, or any particular concept of family. And workplaces have to make room for that care and value it, uh, both because it's important for us as a race, but it's actually hugely important for us as individuals and makes us better at everything we do. So this kind of global perspective where we think about it for, uh, uh, in terms of reinventing how we work uh, as part of, the, I love that idea that that's part of the fourth industrial revolution. We ju don't just rev revolutionize what we produce, but how and where we produce it. Mm -hmm. uh, and thinking absolutely that this is for men every bit as much as for women. Excellent, okay, so as we wrap up, I want in 30 seconds for you to tell me one trend that you're excited about, because we've thrown up some of the problems, some potential solutions, but one trend that you're excited about that actually is taking us forward in that direction. So, Kate Marie, I'll start with you. Um, I have to say young men. I think um, the, the generation of young men rising into influence, influential positions in their careers and into fatherhood have a um, huge capacity for empathy. They want this work-life integration. Um, they want to be caregivers, and I think that we need to make sure we are always inclusive of them in this conversation. Excellent. I'm sorry, I have to say what I heard from Professor Kloshrop this morning, mm -hmm. that in the next, I don't know how many years, 10 years or something, the way we evaluate growth mm -hmm. is what is going to determine uh, the importance given to things like care. Mm -hmm. Like, is it going to be, are we going to evaluate on GDPs? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if he's saying that it's got to change, let's hope in the next 10 years it starts changing. Because then, uh, uh, that's one way of evaluating your growth. Yeah. 
Um, the thing I've heard this week, which I think made me feel, I, I always try and find uh, silver linings. I always try and turn every negative into a positive. Um, and the thing that I, it's a slightly cynical comment, but the corporate world in the discussions I've heard has woken up to the idea that actually diversity improves performance. Yeah. And that's diversity not only in gender, but also in race and background and everything else. And to my mind, that's likely to make progress much more quickly than anyone doing it because they think it's a good thing. If they do it because it'll make their businesses more successful, then it's more likely to happen. And I, that makes me optimistic about change. I think a um, conservative country like uh, you know, Japan, uh, what is the center core problem is one, companies, two, men. I think we, we have to, as, as she, she talked about it, uh, we have to really change, try to change the mindset. Mm -hmm. But can we do it through public policy or uh, what? And uh, I, I think uh, uh, we have to, as a you know, public policy maker, mm -hmm. I have to uh, think about uh, uh, something that could uh, change the uh, atmosphere of uh, workplace and mindset of male. Well, I'll just leave you with this one thought. I come from the Middle East, and there, unfortunately, young people are seen as a problem, a challenge. What are we going to do with all these young people we have? And here we are where the world is worrying about aging. Well, we've got the young people. Hopefully, they will be welcomed with open arms, and hopefully our countries will start to do better in keeping young people, but also um, improving the state of the world with you all. Thank you. I'd like to thank our panel. Thank you for joining us.